Hi, Rock Buddies. Papa here. Hope you're doing well today. This is the second video in the two-video series about potassium feldspar and its amazing journey from its location in granite, granite nice rocks, and to its final destination in both sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. So, here we go. Okay, in the first video we talked about how potassium feldspar comes from granite and granite gneiss. It's broken down by the physical and chemical processes of weathering into clay minerals, washed down into the stream, and is deposited in several different places. Uh, first of all, it's deposited in the sounds uh, and, and bays along the edge of the ocean between the coastal plain and the barrier islands. It's also deposited in river channels uh, when the rivers overflow their banks and also it's deposited out into the ocean beyond the barrier islands where the rivers that dump into the ocean can carry the small clay particles out further than the barrier islands and the sandy deltas and deposit a blanket of mud around the edge of the continent. Okay, so what happens to that mud? That mud gets built up layer upon layer And the, and the layers on top cause pressure. And that pressure turns that mud into a sedimentary rock called shale. And here's some examples. Here are three examples of shale. This is an, a Cambrian, Cambrian shale, the Rome Formation shale. And as you probably know, shale is fairly soft. You can usually scratch it with your thumbnail uh, you can for sure scratch it with a nickel and it forms in these kind of thin layers that can split off from each other. Uh, it's fairly soft and brittle. Voila! Okay, our next shale specimen. Uh, one thing you can tell about this shale is that it doesn't have a lot of organic matter in it because this um, Cambrian shale was deposited before plants even existed on the land so no organic matter and the red color is from the iron that was oxidized uh, as the uh, the mud traveled in these dry kind of riverbeds on its way to being deposited okay here we have a grayish shale and I don't know if you can see there's fossil bits in there. The light colored things are fossil bits. Let's see what we've got on this side. Nope, nothing there. This is Mississippian shale that was deposited during Mississippian times, which would be about 350 million to 330 million years ago. Uh, yeah. And that was a time just before Africa crashed when most of our country was covered by shallow seas and mud came into those seas and that mud was inhabited by sea creatures that left fossil traces. Here's a piece of shale. You've seen this before. This is Pennsylvanian shale and you might be able to recognize this imprint of a fern. Here again, both Mississippian time and for sure, Pennsylvanian time, we had organic matter. We had plants living on land. And so that would create the organic matter that would make this shale dark. Also, during Pennsylvanian time, which was about 330 million years to 300 million years, uh, the uh, America was laying right slap dab across the tropics. And so it was wet. Uh, and uh, lots of organic material, low oxidation. And the iron is in there, but it wasn't ever oxidized because of the cool, I mean, the, the wet, cloudy conditions of the tropics. Okay, so that's shale. When shale gets attacked, so to speak, by the pressure and heat of metamorphism, it gets compacted and squeezed more, and it turns into a rock called phyllite. 
Okay, how do you... I mean, Slate. I am sorry. Slate. Slate. Everybody's probably familiar with Slate. Slate. It's much harder than shale. You can't easily... You might be able to scratch it with a nickel. But... Um, it doesn't ha it has a harder kind of surface to it sometimes kind of shiny like this one a little bit shiny and as you probably know slate has been used for walkways and landscaping walls and that sort of thing and even roofs okay let's apply some even more wait slate is a metamorphic rock okay shale is just a sedimentary rock but the pressure and heat of metamorphism turns shale into slate. And slate is a metamorphic rock. Let's apply even more metamorphic pressure and heat to slate. And it turns into something called phyllite. Now, what's the difference between slate and phyllite? The main difference between slate and phyllite visually is that the phyllite is shiny. See, that's much shinier than the slate. Uh... There's a shiny piece. So phyllite is shiny. That's probably a piece of slate that got pushed over into the phyllite section. If you want to see some phyllite, you can go to Great Smoky Mountains National Park along the middle prong in a uh, section and uh, along the road that leads from Sugarlands Visitor Center to Middle Prong, which is a little river road. There's a lot of this Metcalf phyllite there in the cliffs. Phyllite is shiny. It has a real definite shine to it. Okay. Now let's look at the final step of metamorphism. We had shale, which is a sedimentary rock formed from mud and clay. Metamorphic pressure turns it into first into slate, which is harder and maybe might have a tiny bit of uh, shine to it. More metamorphic pressure you get phyllite. Phyllite has a definite sheen, a definite shine to it. And then you put metamorphic pressure on phyllite and you get the final product, which is schist. Isn't that a funny word, but it's German. I don't know what it means. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to give the German definition, but schist is shiny. Schist is spectacularly shiny. Um, look at this. What, are, what is that shiny stuff? It's muscovite mica. The metamorphic pressure and heat has transformed the minerals, the clay minerals, into muscovite mica. And a lot of times that muscovite mica will slough off in these little discs if you get a, get a lot of um, uh, strike-slip kind of metamorphism like we had in the Brevard Fault Zone. Then you get these but I call them schist pennies. They're just roundish coin shapes of this pressed mica. Notice in this piece of schist, these little dark spots, that those are hunks of garnet. And garnet is a mineral that uh, is indicative of a specific grade of metamorphism. And they, they actually call it the garnet grade, I believe. This piece up here, this piece of schist here is called uh, oh, graphite, graphitic schist, graphitic schist, graphite. Uh, what's happened with this is that the organic material in the mud has been put under such heat and pressure that it's turned it into pure carbon, which is graphite. So you get this graphitic schist, but the, main, but the graphitic schist is also super shiny. I think there are some tiny little specks of garnet in there. So you can tell it's experienced the garnet grade of metamorphism. Look at this schist. This is an interesting schist. This is quartz muscovite schist. Yeah, there's quartz and there's, um, well, this, pro this start probably started out as a mix of sand and mud. And metamorphism has turned it into this quartz muscovite schist. It's got layers of quartz in there mixed in with the layers of muscovite and the layers of muscovite are small um, 
This brown stuff is very likely to be selimanite, which is a, another mineral that indicates a very high grade of metamorphism. And just looking at this quartz muscovite schist, you can tell it has experienced a whole lot of metamorphism. Here's another quartz muscovite schist. And you see the garnets in there? Yeah, and see the reddish kind of color, the purplish reddish kind of color? That is pyrite, which is um, iron and sulfur mixed together. And that is an indication. When you see, the, when you see a schist, quartz muscovite schist with a lot of pyrite in it, you know it has experienced a special kind of metamorphism called hydrothermal metamorphism. And that's where volcanic activity has flushed through this sand and mud mixture uh, with hot superheated water that contains uh, iron and sulfur and flush those minerals into the, uh, the sand mud mix. And this sand mud mix is, could also possibly be material that was blown out of a volcano, which could be quartz and potassium feldspar, blown out of a stratovolcano in a subduction zone where island arcs are forming and it's blown out and it piles up uh, low density piles up under the water on the flanks of the volcano and these these hot these black smokers that are being produced uh, on the seabed nearby from the volcanic action below flush through this material and uh, cause hydrothermal alteration to occur uh, which imparts the uh, reddish pinkish color. As a matter of fact, you know, the guys who look for precious metals like gold, silver, copper, and other metals look for that reddish pyrite staining in the um, schist because if iron and sulfur can be flushed into these uh, materials, then gold, silver, and copper, and other zinc and lead can also be flushed in. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the um, Dahlonega gold got into the uh, ocean sediments that exact way. The sediments were laying on the ocean floor and volcanic activity below. Black smokers and hot volcanic vents from the subduction process uh, took in water, heated it up, and the, the hot, super hot water picked up all, all iron, sulfur, and gold, and rose up and deposited that uh, gold and iron and sulfur in the sea bottom muds, which were metamorphosed into pyritic schist. And then, uh, later on, metamorphic pushing and shoving caused uh, water to surf circulate through that material, pick up the gold and the quart and the silicon and deposit it into these big gold filled quartz veins where the Dahlonega gold was mined from. Okay guys, that's the story of potassium feldspar and how it interacts with the natural processes of weathering and erosion and um, the flow of streams giving rise to the beckoning call of gravity and also how metamorphism transforms that potassium feldspar into rocks like shale sedimentary uh, and then slate which is metamorphic, phyllite which is metamorphic and finally schist which is the ultimate um, end product of the journey of potassium feldspar. Okay, I hope that was helpful to you guys. Uh, I enjoy making these videos and um, if you like them, please subscribe. That helps me to know if they're uh, hitting the mark or not. And uh, you guys have a great day. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your comments because I'm interested in you and I'd love to know what you guys are up to. So, all right, have a great day and Papa out.